Good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And again, a warm welcome to Oracle Open World 2019 here in London. I'm never sure of the etiquette of this, but it's not too late to wish everybody Happy New Year, is it? Happy New Year, Happy 2019. Are there any other gloomy Scotsmen here apart from me? Any other gloomy Scots? Got some Scots? A whole, yay, a whole year of happiness. Pretty tall order. Bit of torture, really. So maybe for us, perhaps a year of safety for our families and prosperity. Maybe that's what we all need, and a bit of luck. Because my goodness, it's a challenging world out there. We all know that. None so more, perhaps, than our friends toiling away a couple of miles up the river there in the Houses of Parliament, that hotbed of disruption. It's easy to knock them a bit, but it's a pretty hard job that we give them. They have to deal with disruption, not just the exciting kind that comes with technology, creative disruption, but an awful lot of other disruption too. We ask them to work out how we should trade with one another, how we regulate ourselves. Questions all of us, I know, will be very interested in, the impact upon our businesses and our IT. But we also create questions for them from our technologies. What on earth is privacy really going to mean and how are we going to respect that in a world awash with data? Very real questions. And I'm sure nobody here would want to dodge any of them, and we're not going to. We're going to hit these questions head on in the closing session today. As you heard from Amanda, we'll be joined by Lord Malloch Brown, who is the former Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Can you imagine how many times I practiced saying that before I came up here? He's now a member of the House of Lords, and he'll be guiding our conversation as we look at some of the issues of ethics and morals that are raised by our technologies, and some of the geopolitical happenings that will impact upon us and our businesses. That's a session this afternoon not to be missed. But neither, of course, is this a session to be missed either, and you're not because you're here. We're going to be looking at innovative technologies coming out of the Oracle stable, and in particular, how they are driving business benefits in our organizations, IoT, blockchain, cloud, of course, and that forever young technology, artificial intelligence. It's been around the block for a while, but is now really starting to, to deliver. All of these technologies are driving immense change in the world around us. It's making us rethink all of our relationships with our customers and suppliers, and indeed one another, as individuals. It's disrupting entire industries. I know that. You know that. Why now? This change is being driven by a rate of innovation which is faster than anything we've seen before. Now, I know it's easy. We're all getting older, every one of us, every gray hair, everything around us seems to be moving more quickly. But innovation truly is. And I can tell you it's very visible. For me, having been 20 years with an Oracle, I can see the pace of innovation picking up more and more. And I'm sure it's the same in all of your organizations too. Why is that happening? Well, smart people are able to connect and identify one another much more quickly than they ever could. You can form a virtual team in minutes, identify skills that will complement it, and people with common interests. And you can now have a rich collaboration, not just an occasional co phone call or a video call. There are rich collaborative environments. And perhaps most of all, when we get together with a rich collaborative environment, we increasingly have access to growing data pools. It's like having a laboratory next door to you. Your idea, your thesis, a new insight. Let's look at these outliers. It's there for almost instant experimentation. Put together smart people, rich collaborative environment, and lots of data. 
and you get innovation. And even more so, very visible information hotspots around about the globe. Bangalore, here in London, Silicon Valley in Seattle. Much of that innovation is being directed towards technology itself to build still better tools to allow us with perhaps machine learning, analytics and others to dig deeper into data to gain even more profound insights, which of course builds a platform allowing us a, virtu a virtuous upward spiral of incredibly fast innovation. It's very, very visible in our business over the decades. I know it's making all of us think, business leaders, technologists, just what's possible. Everything seems to be, and it is, up for grabs. Where do we even start? It's interesting to look at the things that are of most value in your life, either as a business unit or as a company, or even as an individual. Obviously, food and shelter, but what about listening to music? What about healthcare advice, getting from A to B? If this catalog of value in your life, you can now look at every single item and ask the question, how is that value being created? Could it be created in a different way with new technologies? Is it being created as quickly and as efficiently as it could be? How is that value being delivered to me? Is it coming a via physical route? Or given new technologies, could that value be dif delivered differently? Whether it's listening to music via a vinyl record or a digital stream on a 5G network, whether it's receiving healthcare advice from an old guy with a pipe, a leather bag, and some medicines, or from the computer in your hand. Almost everything of value in our existence is being reassessed to discover whether or not it can be delivered in a more efficient and effective way. It's an extraordinary period of opportunity. And it's also, therefore, a period of challenge. I love saying that. Whenever you're in a room and you say there's a challenge, somebody always pops up and says, oh, there must be an opportunity too. Well, if there's an opportunity, there must be a challenge too, so there. If only the challenge is to grasp that opportunity and deliver it. And that is up to us, because we're actually all part, we're all here, bound by the same thread. We're all part of the same family. Whether you're a CEO or a line of business leader, looking to use information to streamline your processes, make your organization more efficient. Whether you're an architect looking to source information from different locations, make it synchronized, make it clean, get in the right place at the right time. Whether you're a procurement officer looking after the purchase of IT or seller, creating a market, or whether you're a developer, magicking value out of nothing. We're all part of the same family of professionals associated with information. And the world does look towards us for some answers to meet that challenge and use these technologies to true benefit. Certainly business leaders look to us. My goodness, holding the golden key for productivity. How do I cope with fewer doctors and yet more sick people? Less fuel and yet more parcels to deliver. It's us and our use of information that is key. And we all have our roles to play in that. The role that Oracle plays has in many ways been very consistent. For literally decades, we make tools to help others manage their information more easily and therefore be able to focus on what you do best, whether it's banking or telco or oil and gas or whatever. Adam Smith would have been proud. These tools may come in the form of business applications, platform perhaps, data repositories, databases, and even infrastructure. More recently, in case you didn't know, every single one of these has been made available as a service from the cloud, business application, platform, and infrastructure. Connect more easily, scale to meet your business requirements, much easier to use, much more performant. But just as I said earlier, the pace of innovation is exponential. And innovation on top of these technologies has been continuing apace. I'd like to invite you to join me on a wee tour 
of the development groups within a Silicon Valley titan. Silicon Valley titan with big ears. It's not Shrek. Shrek's got small ears. It's Oracle, of course. And our big ears actually come from literally hundreds of thousands of customers for decades across the globe. Chief executive officers asking us, I realize this data is increasingly the most important asset I have. How can I keep it secure? I don't want to lose my job and the entire value of the company from a data breach. DBA saying, can we lift some of this burden of our shoulders? It was fun managing a few hundred users and a few gigabytes. But it's becoming a little bit too much. These voices of business issues and problems that need solutions and the technical ones that follow them are our bread and butter, very much what we listen to. And we take them and we do what these guys in development do best, is they innovate. They use their knowledge and they innovate. So let's begin our tour, if I may, at the top of the stack, the bit of the iceberg above all the plumbing, which we all see and interact with on a daily basis. Business applications, my goodness, they've come a long way from the days of green screens, which just really mimicked phone calls and memos, allowing us to perhaps make a journal entry and do some summary queries. Our approach to business applications now is to ensure that everybody associated with the enterprise is fully informed of what they're doing, no more making clueless decisions, hopefully, or decisions in a dark room. Making decisions in an informed environment, thanks to your business applications, being fully engaged with the organization and your colleagues, as I said earlier. Flexible and innovative, if you can share information, speak the same language right across the organization. And of course, business applications are there to really make productivity happen. They're our modern day equivalent of the tractor or the, uh, or the ship making us much stronger than we, we are ourselves. They've come a long, long way. But in the last 18 months, they've come a huge leap further. Because Oracle has now embedded machine learning, artificial intelligence into these applications. It's changing the whole concept of a business application from being something which is largely passive, responsive to your needs, to something which can actually be an active business advisor to use vast amounts of information and experience to make suggestions. I spotted this pattern. This may happen next to make accurate predictions. Not as much a personal digital assistant as an incredibly clever business digital assistant. Enter intelligent business applications. Oracle's always looked at applications, I'm not apologetic for this, holistically, the whole organization holistically. Some of these divides between ERP and SCM are, a lot of it's historical, they don't always make real sense if you look at a whole organization. Processes cross across one another, data is shared. It makes sense to have a complete suite which shares the same data and has end-to-end -end process. And that's exactly what we've developed, a complete suite. You don't need to use it all if you don't want, but there's a complete suite and by key industry as well. And we've been fairly good at doing that. ERP, number one, SCM, HCM, number one in the cloud. And that experience has allowed us to, for example, extract what's the best industry process here, what's the best practice in this industry, in this process. Let's make sure that's available. Best practice, good. But critically, as so often, it's given us the data, given us the knowledge to build in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And there's an embarrassment of opportunities to apply artificial intelligence in business applications. Just think about it. The very words ERP just lend themselves immediately to the concept of constant resource planning, using inputs, knowledge, experience, patterns to plan more accurately for the future. And whether it's examples such as dynamically changing pricing according to market requirements, there's a host of other examples. It's very similar for supply chain management. You can see immediately how you can use machine learning and its experience and its pattern matching to, again, optimize perhaps your logistics. Maybe not so obvious to everybody here, how would you use AI in something like human capital management, HR? It's 
absolutely possible. You can spot patterns and experience in vast quantities of data. People who have done this course benefit particularly if they do that course. People with this sort of background and who have done these courses are very good in this sort of job, less good in that sort of job. So our machine learning experience tells us. And as for customer experience, it only even begins with the concept of being able to offer just the right offer to just the right person at just the right time. Not because of an anecdote or a whim or a heuristic, but because of hard data-driven evidence. And the new innovations continue, simplifying the interaction using bots, chatbots, whether they're voice or whether they're text, new integrations to enrich the data that's already in the application. And I'd like to touch upon this one, because with all the, the glory of machine learning and AI, it's very practical development in these applications as well. Upgrading on-premise applications, on-premise version upgrades. It's not always a journey of unbridled ecstasy. Sometimes it might fall short of that. And yet, contrastingly in the cloud, my Spotify app has probably been upgraded four times since I started speaking. It's being done by people who understand it, by people who wrote the app. In that instance, cloud is certainly good. So it would be nice to be able to do one last upgrade, which takes us from the on-prem into cloud, and that's exactly what we focused on. To make sure the tools are there to allow an easy, simple, and final upgrade into the cloud from whence life becomes a lot easier. So let's now start our trip. We're going to go up the Thames. We're going to perhaps close our eyes as we pass the Houses of Parliament, block our ears as we pass Heathrow, and then we're going to lie, arrive in lovely sunny Reading, where many of the Oracle staff who develop our business applications are. And then waiting for us at the door, of course, is somebody from California. Such is life in a global organization. I'm delighted to introduce the, the host of our first stop on our tour of the development groups for EPM. Please welcome to the stage, Matt Bradley. Good to, see you, Good to see you. Okay, listen, I've got a few questions here, written a bit of paper, so I wonder if you can shed a bit more light to my traveling companions here who've come along okay. with us up the river from, from Reading. Um, I've mentioned machine learning broadly, Matt. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about what really makes these business applications intelligent. It's a good question. By implication, they're currently not intelligent, right? Um, I think what makes them intelligent is pretty much about the interactivity that you're having as a user of the system, uh, where the applications themselves try to understand the context, the activity that you're trying to perform, and achieve that in the most effective manner. What then extends it further is that through those interactions and through accessing the data, we can actually improve that over time with the applications learning and then producing an even better outcome the next time through as we move forward and progress. Yeah. Can you give us some really specific examples? Because I tried to give some there, Matt, you know, of, of the various areas, but maybe give us an idea so we can get a concrete fix on exactly what sorts of things this can do. So, I mean, a great example if you take the planning uh, area, I'm doing a forecast, yep. is the ability to look at your history and based upon that history, identify algorithms or correlations between that history. So I could take, say, an operational driver, number of units sold, and then project that going forward, leveraging the machine learning right. algorithms, where I may actually remove some of the human bias from that equation. Uh -huh. So really looking at the core data right. and really right. understanding. So you're going to get a, a disinterested view Correct. of what's going on, Correct. which is exactly what we want in many of these situations. What's, what's going to come forward from this? Because this is the question I always get. You know, even when we're at the, really the outset of a technology such as this, applying it, there seems to me to be so much that we can do with this yet. What do you see as being the next wave? How are we going to use this going forward? I think there's three areas that we're really focusing on. One is uh, with pervasive AI. So as we interact with the system, things like auto-suggest, things like auto-complete, right. those kind of interactions. You obviously mentioned chat box yeah. uh, engagement. So if you really want to have a conversation with the application, that application needs to have a certain level of intelligence. Yeah. So when you ask it the questions, it responds appropriately to the responses from those particular questions. So that would be a great example. And anything we're going to continue sort of driving it out further through things like better forecasting, um, 
some of the examples that you mentioned earlier, uh, if I have an excess of cash, which vendor should I pay first Aye. and get better discounting from that standpoint? Right. Again, looking at the data, looking at the history, and driving in suggestions from that particular standpoint, and much more recommendations coming it through. It really does open up a whole new world. Correct. You walk Absolutely. into your office and you chat to your organization and ask its advice especially on these little things that are often difficult to track. Who should I pay next? Whose interest rate's the best, yep. et cetera. But even just simple things like it's Friday, it's five o'clock, uh, and I'm logging into my ERP. Time for Cracker Jack. Time for cracker, cracker Jack, exactly. It's really understanding at that point in time that maybe I'm probably doing expenses. Yeah. And then automatically presenting that to the end user. So they're not necessarily having to navigate all the way through the application to get to the task they're really trying to achieve. So really fantastic. What about, our, I hate to mention it on the stage here, Matt, but I've got to say the competition. There's other people out there who are trying to make mm -hmm. uh, business applications as well. How do you see that shaping up? Well, I think the biggest differences are there are fundamentally three areas that we're really looking at. Um, first and foremost, a lot of this feature function that we're talking about is available now. Mm -hmm. So it's not roadmap, it's not futures. Uh, you can take advantage of both in ERP and HCM and CX and EPM, uh, some of those capabilities. Yeah. Uh, two, the other approach that we're taking from an application standpoint is to do it in context. So as an end user, when I log into the system, what we're really trying to do is give you a better way to do your job, not necessarily just expose machine learning or yeah. artificial intelligence for that state. Exactly. So if I'm doing budgeting and planning and forecasting, I'm just leveraging that technology to achieve a better forecast. Exactly, so it's truly in the system. So it's in the system rather than with some of the other vendors that's out there, it's a separate place you have to go to no, no. and understand and do those Yeah, and things. we all know that if it's easy to use, it'll be used. Correct. If it's not, it won't. And then the third thing that we really uh, will focus upon is because of the cloud delivery mechanism, we can accelerate new features in a much more rapid cadence than what we could do in an on-premise standpoint. Yep. So the ability to have this innovation powerhouse, the ability to move this much forward quicker and faster. This for is, this is the Spotify effect, isn't Correct. it? Every day you come in, there's another wee ear on the thing telling you there's more functionality. Correct. Fantastic. Matt, thank you very much. Thank We've you. got a fly, but thank you very much. Thank you there. so much. Cheers. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Matt. And he is from California. Honestly, there's Irish bars wherever you go. But the proof of the pudding is always in the eating. I love Royal Bank of Scotland. I opened an account with Royal Bank of Scotland when I was 17 years old in Drummond Rocket and I've banked with them since and they use our technology. So let's hear from RBS. One of the challenges that we faced previously was to be able to model scenarios really quickly. And we weren't able to do this because of the number of spreadsheets that we had. The EPM software gave us an opportunity to take on something that was strategically important to RBS, but it was something that we could do quickly. Through the EPM cloud, we're going really, really fast. And I'm not talking years, I'm talking months to deploy and to uh, make our models live. There was five uh, benefits that the Royal Bank of Scotland were able to uh, achieve. The first and, and uh, a very important one was cost effectiveness. Secondly, better insight and control. Thirdly, simplifying the processes. Fourth, a continuous innovation of a system being updated on a monthly basis. And fifthly, it allows us to move towards, uh, in the future, a zero-touch rolling forecast. Zero-touch forecasting is our aspiration. Um, we feel that the uh, EPM cloud in the future will help us move to autonomous forecasts. What we mean by that is that the forecasts will run themselves. Now, we're not quite there yet, but uh, the EPM cloud has put a great base uh, in place for us to start to build towards that. In terms of our roadmap, we're going to be rolling out ERP cloud globally. This is going to hopefully provide us with some great new insight uh, connected up to uh, our Oracle platform. Working with a partner like Oracle uh, provides us uh, with some of the latest technology developments that are produced in the industry using things like blockchain, chatbots, uh, and actually the thing that I really love the most is the, the SaaS environment, this offers the service, because uh, this actually means for us as Royal Bank of Scotland that we get updates on a monthly basis. This makes a difference. We can see the product evolve. Oh, isn't that fabulous? I, tell you, I used to think I joined IT just as it was kicking off 25, 30 years ago, but it looks like it's just starting to kick off now. We live in the information age, and just like the industrial age before it, there's a fuel which is there to really power it. This time, obviously, it's not coal and oil dug from the, uh, from the North Sea or from the Welsh mountains. It's data, which is what powers our world around about us and what creates 
real value when used properly and effectively. It can generate real productivity and save the Earth resources if used properly. It's not smelly, and it can be reused. The more we use data, in fact, unlike oil, the more valuable it becomes. But, as we all know, it can also be stolen. And it can also be a bit sensitive to how it's looked after. It takes a bit of effort, especially if there's more and more of it. And in fact, that's exactly the problem. Looking after that data, keeping it secure, collecting it, managing it, was always there as a cost, try to keep it low. But now, with the sheer deluge that we have of data being created, it's always being created, I guess, but now it's being captured, we realize, ooh, that's a value. I might get insight out of that. There might be nuggets inside that data. We all want to collect it and store it and manage it and access it. And the burden is, quite honestly, just becoming out of hand. Simple, it's out of hand. And it'll start to suppress our ability to grow. Time, perhaps, just as with applications, for machines to come to our rescue. Maybe it's time that data stood on its own two feet and data actually looked after itself, enter the autonomous database. I think after 20 whatever it is years of an oracle, I can very safely say from this stage that this is the most innovative product I've ever seen come out of the oracle stable, the autonomous database, next generation of database cloud services. It tackles head on these questions deriving directly from business issues. It, like the perfect painkiller, goes straight to the heart of the pain. We need to reduce costs. By removing a lot of the tasks of drudgery of looking after data, it can save admin costs of 80%. But more than that, self-tuning. It can look at the workload and look at its environment, and it can tune itself, and it can save up to 70% on the resources required. We'll hear about that later. We can't cope anymore with the kind of risks. It's too dangerous to depend upon, I'm afraid, one another to look after our data. We need machines to the rescue, I'm afraid. We have to, to try and reduce the risks. An autonomous database can do that too. And we must crack this problem. For decades now, we've had our friends um, from, from uh, many uh, of the analysts and organizations tell us, quite rightly, that seven, se 70 cents out of every dollar are spent on keeping the lights on in IT. It's just not good enough, especially given all of the opportunity that faces us now. Perhaps if we could automate some of that task, we could change that balance and spend a lot more time innovating. So the autonomous database is self-driving. Look after itself. It'll provision more capacity as it needs, and it'll tune itself. So workload changes, it needs more of this or that. It'll actually add indices or drop them as it needs. It's self-securing. It won't go to sleep. It won't miss some anomalous behavior. It'll spot it. It'll say, why is this being accessed at this time? And of course, it'll patch itself whenever it needs to. And God forbid, if anything does go wrong in the environment, it's also self-repairing. It'll make sure it picks itself off the ground, gets up again, giving us the possibility of having less than 2.5 minutes a month for planned and unplanned downtime. It's available in two flavors. You can get these benefits from two separate offerings. One you're probably aware of for some time, the Autonomous Data Warehouse, really aimed at data marts, data lakes, and looking after data, perhaps for the purposes of machine learning. But more recently, we've also launched a version suitable for high throughput transactions. So it's the ATP. We call that the Autonomous Transaction Processing. This is the one that's set to really, rev well, both of them are set to revolutionize the whole way in which we manage data. So let's now continue our journey. Let's jump into our plane at Heathrow and we'll fly, of course, across the northwest of Scotland. Make sure you look out the window when the seatbelt lights come off and look at these beautiful beaches below you on the west coast of Scotland. Wow. You'll certainly go wow if you ever go down there and put your feet in the water. It's not warm. We'll go over Hudson Bay and we'll come in, of course, to San Francisco and these beautiful buildings in Redwood Shores into the very hallowed ground of the database development group. And my goodness, the person meeting us is one of the most extraordinary gentlemen you could ever want to meet, and one of the nicest individuals. He's the grandpappy, that's the grandfather for us Europeans. 
He's the grandfather of the Oracle database. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure many of you will already know, please welcome to the stage Andy Mendelssohn. Sorry for calling you a, a granddad there, Andy. But <laughs> I'm sure you'll survive. Uh, so, Andy, I've given the headlines of the autonomous database there, but I wonder if you could give us, in your own words, as the, as the creator of it, I wonder if you could give us, in your own words, more about the autonomous data. And perhaps, Andy, if you could focus on this issue about what's the difference between the cloud service autonomous and, of course, the, the 18C database, the next version. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so a lot of people are confused about the difference between sort of database software and a cloud service. So just want to give you a little insight into what is the autonomous database. Well, at, at its core, the base of it is the Exadata infrastructure. So a lot of you use Exadata today on-prem. It's, you know, it's the best, highest performance, most reliable platform for running Oracle database. Every autonomous database runs on Exadata infrastructure in our public cloud. We fully manage all that infrastructure as a service. Uh, next layer up is, of course, our database 18C software. Um, again, that software is fully provisioned, fully managed by Oracle. You have no need to do that anymore. And then around the, the database and the x infrastructure, we have a lot of automation and artificial intelligence, expert systems to monitor the systems and make sure everything's running really well with uh, high reliability and, and good performance. Yeah. So, so it needs to be in the cloud effectively in order to be able to deliver mm -hmm. what it does to that. Andy, there's a lot of business customers in here as well. So I've been speaking mm -hmm. about the business apps. And of course, it's always the way, you know, half, half people turn on when they talk about applications and the other half of the technology. H how does the autonomous database filter through to the business? How can we expect to see these benefits materialize? Yeah, so the, the big thing going on now is like if, if you go out there, the biggest enterprises, the biggest governmental organizations today in the world run on Oracle databases, at least the vast majority of them. And all these organizations now are looking at coming up with strategies for moving to the cloud. And there's really no good way to do that today on, on the standard popular clouds out there. Uh, but with Autonomous Database, you can now do that. We have, I think, the big breakthrough is we have now the, the infrastructure and database technology that will let our biggest enterprises move to public clouds. Yeah. It's a big, big, big hit. Now, Andy, one of the other questions that I know, again, we've got business people, we've also, of course, got DBAs here in the audience, and this is going to be disruptive. It's, it's mm -hmm. there to remove the burden. What's going to be the change in the role of database administrators particularly, but maybe perhaps IT departments as a whole, on the introduction of what is a, a let's face it, a pretty disruptive technology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, what I like to say about this, of course, as you move to, to a cloud, um, the cloud vendor takes over you know, a lot of the traditional IT work, you know, managing all the infrastructure, you know, managing the networks, et cetera. Um, on the database front, of course, who runs the databases? It's the DBAs. And as you, you look at sort of the DBAs' roles in organizations today, they spend a lot of time doing things like patching and upgrades that the business management does not see have, has much value to the yeah. business. And so, what autonomous database is going to do is going to free up the DBAs to not spend their time on things their, their bosses don't really think are important. And now they can focus on important things like you know, data architecture. How do we organize all the data in our enterprise so we can get value out of it? They can now work with the developers in the enterprise yeah. to get more value out of the data. So they become a lot more valuable um, to their yeah. bosses. Absolutely. And this is hardly new, is it, Andy? Especially in technology. Started my career. Actually, before assembler language program, I used to have to put in the hex codes myself. When a compiler came along, I thought, this is, this is the end of my skills. But of course, all you do is you start using these tools mm -hmm. and moving yourself up. Yeah. Andy, to me, a little bit like we're speaking with Matt and the introduction of AI into applications just sets the scene, I think, for years ahead. And in my view, with autonomous too, frankly, I can see so much. But perhaps, can you give us any hint of more innovations to come? Is this it for, for years and years, now seeing Autonomous develop, mm -hmm. or is there anything else around the corner? Yeah, so, um, you know, we've been around a long time, you know, 30 years now, yeah. innovating in the database space, and in most software spaces, you know, after five, 10 years, innovation ends, yeah. right? You, you forget about it, you know, yeah. operating systems, what are yeah. those, you know, kind of thing. Well, 
data, data is now like the core asset of pretty much any, every enterprise, every government organization out there. Um, you know, there are companies that have no assets at all except their data. Yeah. You know, think Uber or something like that. And so this is going to drive huge innovation moving forward. Um, so the next 30 years, more and more innovation. What, what are the key areas that, that drive us? Um, obviously, the technology underneath database is changing. And one of the big changes that's coming out actually this year is memory is becoming persistent. So what does that mean? It means today, when your server crashes, the DRAM in that server loses all the information. It's not storage, but the new generation of memory chips coming out are actually going to be like storage. When the system goes down, their contents will be saved. And this changes the entire you know, sort of thinking about how you engineer a database for high performance. Wow. So we have major radical re-architecture going on um, around the Oracle database, around persistent memory. Yeah. Um, the number two big thing, of course, is, is getting value out of the data. You know, that's what everybody is about now. You're, you have all this data, you're competing with your, your competitors, and you know, how are you competing? You're seeing who can get the most value out of that data. So we, what we are trying to do is make sure all the analytic algorithms, whether it's machine learnings, spatial, graph analytics, all those analytics can get at all of the data you have in your cloud, in your enterprise, so that you can derive business value out of it. So we, we are trying to sort of make all your data into sort of a virtual uh, pool of information that your analysts can easily, easily find and leverage for business value. Fantastic, Andy. And I honestly thought, with eight I thought that's it. We've got no further to go, but my goodness, there, there's a long way to go. Yeah. Andy, we've got another flight to get. Thank you okay. very much. And I know you'll be speaking sure. later on in the sessions later on this afternoon. Yeah. Thank you so much, Andy. What a super, super guy. What a pleasure to work with a man like Andy. Now, we're going to take that moment in every Oracle keynote. We're going to do a demo. And of course, it's been completely untested. So if I can invite Keith Laker, please, up to the stage. Let's see how we, oh, you're this side, Keith. Let's see how we get on with this demo. Please welcome Keith Laker. Right, Keith, are you going to start by rebooting that then, or are you actually OK? No, I, I think we're OK. Whoa. So what I want to show you today is how in an autonomous world we can make data warehousing fast, simple, and flexible. By building a new autonomous data warehouse and then adding intelligent visualizations using Analytics Cloud. So here we are now. We're on our uh, cloud landing page. And to start the process, all I have to do is click Create Instance and then pick Autonomous Data Warehouse from my list of services that you see there. That's going to take me to my Autonomous Data Warehouse Management Console, where I can now create a new Autonomous Data Warehouse directly here in our London data center. So it's a very simple process. All I have to do is give it a name. Let's call it OW London. And then what I next need to do is work out, well, how much resources do I think I need for this? And let's start with, say, four CPUs. Four terabytes. Not bad. We'll go with that. And then I have to set my administrator database password. And we'll give you some guidance, some help on how to set that. Scott and Tiger. That'll do. <laughs> um, and then next, you need to think about, OK, do I want to take some of my licenses from my existing on-premise systems, or do I want to start a new cloud subscription? That's it. If you're a DBA, that's, you know, this is going to be quite revolutionary. I click Create now. My database is provisioning. I'm underway. So my data waste. Pause for a second there, Keith. That, that's a pretty big click as clicks go. That is. So that is actually instantiating now a complete Oracle database on four CPUs and a terabyte, just like that. Yes. As Tommy Cooper. And it's now building. So while I, while this comes up and it'll it'll take a you know very short period of time, it, the logo on the left will go green and then I'm ready to start using this straight away. I can start making connections. So what I want to do is flip over to Analytics Cloud now and start working with that data set straight away. So you can see within Analytics Cloud, we give you some pre-built reports that you can use. Um, but or, as an alternative, you, know, you can just start typing straight away. So if I'm interested, for example, in sales by product category or product subcategory, I can just type this in. And Analytics Cloud will intelligently pick the most sensible visualization for that query that it's busy building. Now, the nice thing here is on this canvas, 
all of these queries, all of these visualizations are completely interactive. So if I want to zoom in on something, I can just focus in on that data set and start doing deeper and deeper analysis. So I've shown you the simplicity of all this. What about the speed and flexibility? Well, here's a, a quite complex query uh, running a heat map. Yep. Uh, we've got a query time down here with four CPUs. Let's say for you, Andrew, I need yep. to run this faster because you yep. want the results quicker. Ramp it, I do, and you've got to finish for lunch. Let's yep. scale it up in real time to 16 CPUs. So I'm going to take 16 CPUs. All I have to do is refresh this query, and the resources are going to become online. This stays online while we're scaling. It's going to re-execute the query with 16 CPUs, and we'll see it comes back considerably faster. It's another pretty faster. important click as clicks go. Yeah, it is. It's a big click here. Now, let's say I've finished. Let's say the demo's come to an end, and I'm going to head home now. Um, what I'd like to be able to do is maybe reduce my cloud charges. Cool. Let's turn our, our data warehouse off. Let's stop it. And I can either do that from within the cloud console or from within my report, as we've shown here. Fantastic. Keith, absolutely excellent. Well done, and it even worked. Thank you very much Thank indeed. <laughs> Fabulous. The demo is over. I can relax. My goodness. That demonstration is available to you in the form of a trial. You can take a trial of this. And would you believe it? Every single one of the Oracle senior sales managers has gone through that. Everybody here has, in fact, instantiated an Oracle data warehouse. We put, in the space of a few moments, the equivalent to power of power to a major bank, created these warehouses, load them up, played around with analytics, and shut it all down again. My goodness, and if these guys can do it, anybody can. So it's possible to do. Do take a trial of the Autonomous Data Warehouse. But as always, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Let's hear from Data Intensity about how they make use of an autonomous, the world's only autonomous database. Let's roll the video. Data Intensity decided to use the Oracle Autonomous Data Warehouse Cloud to solve a problem we had around finance and financial reporting. Our finance team were probably spending 60% of their time just getting the data out of systems and therefore only for the remaining 40% generating value back to the business. We chose Autonomous because it was quick, easy, solved a lot of problems for us, and really suited our agile development. Some of the main benefits we got from implementing the Autonomous Data Warehouse Cloud was an initial saving of nearly a quarter of a million dollars. We're now seeing users getting paid refreshes four to five times faster than they were before, and we're running on 10 times less hardware than we were previously. The flexibility of the Autonomous Data Warehouse Cloud is amazing. During financial reporting periods, End of quarter, end of year, we can scale the solution up to provide huge performance. The rest of the time, we scale it back down and we're barely paying anything. The biggest compliment we can pay the Autonomous Data Warehouse is we don't administrate the database. The Autonomous Warehouse and Oracle Analytics Cloud have allowed us to put a much greater user community together. We have about 10 times the users accessing the system we used to do, and all of those are driving value rather than just spending their time getting data out of the system. Wow. Matt, you thought your stuff was cool, and it is. But my goodness, that's pretty cool as well, you have to admit. Very, very smart stuff. Let's move on for the final stop on our trip. We're going to look at the cloud infrastructure. I don't know how many Alexas you have in your office, or however many gadgets you have, but they won't work very well without Wi-Fi or electricity. And if they get wet because the windows leak, everything fails. You depend upon the fabric of the building, and the building itself, of course, depends upon the foundations. Big deal, we all know that. But it's often forgotten within IT just to how much extent each clever layer depends upon the one below, probably more than ever as we build ever more sophisticated capability. These super smart apps we heard of from Matt require a super smart platform below them, or they just will be built on sand. And the platform, the autonomous we heard there, it needs a in smart infrastructure underneath that if it's going to have any chance of delivering what it needs to do. So we needed, frankly, we needed a new smart infrastructure. And that's exactly what Oracle did. It was a very, very major investment, very major investment, a lot of effort to construct a completely new cloud infrastructure. Highly innovative. Perhaps the only innovative thing that, or thing that where the innovation ran out was when it came to naming it, because we call it the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Nice and simple, at least. OCI is the only infrastructure that's actually been developed completely for the cloud. It was designed 
from scratch. Now, when I say that on a blank sheet of paper, when I say that, it certainly used intelligence, knowledge, and our ears. We knew what was needed of cloud, but we didn't try and extend an existing architecture, which in turn had really come from blowing up an enterprise architecture. We really created, from scratch, an architecture designed for cloud. Hardware, networking, software, and everything rebuilt from day one. We call it part of our generation two cloud. So the OCI is the infrastructure inside the gen two cloud. Its starting point really of focus and differentiation is from day one building that security. We all know, I'm not gonna bore everybody how important security is. And you all know how it needs to be present everywhere within the stack, especially down at the bottom. So right from day one, in that architecture, we've ensured that the computers which control the cloud, the cloud control plane, or the cloud computers, they're quite separate from the computers that we would use if we're using the cloud. So you've got user computers, you've got controlling computers, and they are separate. Never the twain shall meet. Those who log in and operate and manage the cloud just cannot touch the user stuff. And those who are using the cloud just cannot touch and leap or bridge via the cloud control plane. It's an impenetrable barrier that we've placed around right from scratch. We've also, of course, designed, it's a new architecture. It's done for the first time with a knowledge of the sort of scale and performance that's needed in this ridiculous amounts of, of data and transactions we're coping with. So it's very high performance and, of course, aimed at lower compute costs. And we're very happy, frankly. We're very happy with OCI. It's a great fresh infrastructure, and we're very confident and sure it's going to last us decades and decades into the future. That's given us the confidence to build out that data center coverage. And even as I speak, I know very well the emails are in my box that the data centers are being built out steadily around about the globe as we speak. But not only on our premises, OCI, this new architecture, is also available on your premises, if you so wish. Cloud at Customer has been a very successful offering Oracle has made to have database cloud services in your organization effectively managed as a cloud by Oracle. And we're going to do exactly the same to be able to have a database cloud service in your organization, but now part of the OCI capability, enjoying that performance and that security. We're committed to doing that as well. But there's more to the Generation 2 cloud than the networking and the hardware and the storage. There's a whole raft of capabilities included in Gen 2 Cloud. What would a cloud be if you couldn't just put your hands when you want on development capability? I want to rapidly develop a new capability. I want to include perhaps blockchain. All of that is there, part of the Gen 2 Cloud, usable with your uh, cloud credit effectively that you can use to buy these services. I would love to live in a world where we didn't need integration because everybody used the same data model, hardly likely. We still need integration, probably more than ever, as we enrich different sources of information, possibly from different clouds. These services are there. Standards-based, high-performance integration, part of the Gen 2 cloud. You don't have to waste your time trying to install and configure and get them running. Just put your hands on that in integration capability as you need it. Same for analytics. It's all very well, Andrew, with all of this machines looking at our data. Now and again, we humans want to look at our data too. And again, within this cloud environment, I want to be able to very quickly use some of the tools that you saw Keith using just there to examine my data. We've talked of security, 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 sounding a little bit like Tony Blair here. Security in the infrastructure, security in the autonomous database, but also, of course, security when you start using processes outside your organization with partners and so on. We need to have identity management, authentication, and access brokers, again, built in as part of the Generation 2 cloud, along, of course, with the diamond of them all, the autonomous database. So as our final stop now, we're doing not bad for time, actually. So as our final stop, we're now going to go north of San Francisco, or at least going to put one foot north of San Francisco up to Seattle, because a lot of the hotbed of cloud development takes place in Seattle. I know we're in a virtual world nowadays and anybody can work with any, anybody anywhere, as I said earlier, but it's strange how there's still hotspots. And for some reason, the coffee shops and the grunge uh, clubs of Seattle appear particularly attractive 
to the infrastructure guys. But there's also another hotbed of infrastructure back in the other side of the States, in New England, along with the, the lovely pine trees and infinite horses that you get over there. So we're now going to head our way over again to Seattle and New England, and we're going to meet uh, a leader of the development in what is the newest group under a guy called jo Don Johnson, the newest group within Oracle, the infrastructure team. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Kyle York. Hey, Kyle. How are you? How are you doing? You? I'm very well. How are you enjoying the London weather? Oh, it's wonderful. It's really wonderful. So next time somebody calls you up on the phone and says, come to London, it's cool. Well, it's actually warmer than where we are outside of Boston. Really? So we'll right take now? It. Yeah. Wow. Okay, fantastic. Listen, Kyle, again, as I asked Andy, there are others out there, and Matt, there are others out there who are also creating infrastructure as a service offerings. I've described this being a second generation cloud built from scratch. Can you maybe put a little bit meat on these bones? What really differentiates us from other vendors? Yeah, sure. So our second generation cloud is not unlike many first generation clouds in its on-demand nature, its scalability, its auto scalability, its access controls, governance, those types of things. I think as you look at the types of workloads that have moved to public cloud, they tended to be uh, more measured on Alexa ranking. Uh, you know, think about it, your mobile apps, your e-commerce storefronts, uh, your front-end websites, the properties that drove a lot of traffic and then in turn drove a lot of compute and storage resources. Yep. What we're seeing in Gen 2 Cloud is that there hasn't been a market um, uh, need that's been solved yet for the hard things that we do, uh, the data intensive workloads, the high performance computing. Uh, you've heard about the business applications, financials, your people. These are things that you haven't felt comfortable with historically moving to public cloud because there hasn't been a public cloud provider who knew the enterprise in the way that the likes of an Oracle has. Yep. So from the physical infrastructure to the network, to the virtualization, to the services, and to the governance that lives inside Oracle Cloud infrastructure, we've taken a really hardened approach to look at our customers and ourselves, yep. because we are an enormous enterprise, yep. and realize that there's a whole different expectation game around service level agreements, around compliance, around regulations uh, that was required to build this cloud. And instead of telling everyone that you build, need to build a net, every application, you need to figure out a way to build a net new application yep. to replace it, there needs to be a path to cloud okay. that's there for customers, not just throw out decades and decades of on-premise technologies, but have an environment that is purpose-built for them. Hey, cool, you, you're with it, Kyle. I know you're one of our recent acquisitions from Dyn. That's very much the Oracle DNA. While we want to see innovation and newness, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater with what's back there. There's a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, a lot of investment in the enterprise, which can really be reused. I wonder, the same question I asked Andy, Kyle, there's a lot of business leaders here who I'm sure, quite rightly, will not necessarily be interested in every aspect of you know, the networking within, uh, within our infrastructure. C can you bubble it through to what will this mean if I'm sitting in the head office worried about my you know, competitors in a retail business or something of that yeah. sort? H how does this filter through? What What's the point? Well, I think the market and the analysts, you know, you hear a lot of talk about cloud adoption and the, the pace of cloud adoption. Also, also like, you know, market penetration of cloud adoption. And a lot of times you hear this talked about all the way up the stack, from SaaS all the way down to the physical infrastructure. But when we think about public cloud and its business value, it really is derived up the stack. Yep. In our application suite, we're looking at how do we move applications either to SaaS or to a place where you can actually go run those licensed software applications. Because, right. uh, again, these things don't live uh, in, in their, in their uh, singularity. No. The, the database doesn't live by its lonesome. It lives with integrations and tools and different types of applications and workloads all around it that intersect, right? Yeah. So being able to think about public cloud and think about uh, the controls of the physical infrastructure is not unlike the way that you might think about your physical office space or your data center environments. Uh, it all gets back to the physical at some point, the physical of the actual servers yep, or yep, the routers yep, yep. Or, the or, yep. or the phone or the Internet of Thing device that happens to be connected into the Internet. So it's all about trying to figure out that 
business value of a, a smoother connection with your constituents, whether the constituent is a human being or a thing, uh, all the way back to the physical of, of the on-premise data center, but again, doing that in a virtualized way. So I think there's a big shift where it's not just about what you're spending in cloud today, it's about what you're spending in overall infrastructure investment, IT operations investment, and thinking about the best way to do that. Do you want to use, move from a CapEx world with maintenance and support to a uh, licensed software, or, or sorry, to a SaaS world, which is much more about renting capacity and space and scaling up and scaling down based on your needs. So I think there's a lot of business value in just rethinking the market of IT spend in general. And as a matter of fact, we're going to hear from just a second from a customer in our video who says many of these things. Kyle, I'd love to continue the conversation longer, but I know that we're tight for time. Um, so I'm going to thank you very much. I know that you're speaking this afternoon and a number of your team will be speaking and there's lots of demonstrations outside. Absolutely. There's a lot to learn about OCI folks. A lot of effort gone into that. Well worth taking the time to understand what's there. Right. Thank you very thank much you. for joining thank us, Kyle. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okie dokie, folks. Listen, we'll draw this to a close. Can we see, again, the proof of the pudding is the eating. Let's see uh, Alliance Data have been making great use of OCI. If we can roll that video, please. So at Alliance Data, we provide the data, the technology platforms, the insights, and the analytics to run some of the largest consumer-facing loyalty and digital marketing platforms in the world. As we learn more about the Oracle Cloud infrastructure, we became increasingly comfortable with moving a large set of critical data, in our case, six terabytes of mission-critical data from on-premise to Oracle Cloud in our first move, and uh, we run our most important parts of our business on that. We moved PeopleSoft and half a dozen supporting apps in a span of less than five months. I was very happy to report to my boss that the, the migration completed successfully with no business interruptions and I had a schedule. I originally made the decision based more on operational and security reasons, but I'm pleasantly surprised to hear that we're saving more than a million dollars a year. I'm very confident in OCI from a reliability and security perspective. I would say that I am sleeping better at night than I was when we were running our systems in a data center. Fabulous. Our journey's over, folks. We've been around the main development groups within Oracle. I hope you've enjoyed the trip. I hope it's given you some insight into what sorts of innovations are taking place, and perhaps more importantly, sparked a few ideas about how they might be brought to bring business value with you. Perhaps in closing, if I may, and trying to make sure that we're in good time here, a couple of points I may not have been able to proper, properly cover. We're really anxious to make sure that there's as simple a path as possible for you, our loyal and customers whom we greatly appreciate. Try and make sure this is as easy a path as possible for you to take advantage of these technologies. No big leaps and jumps, investing in consulting effort, investing in IP and tools to make migrations to new business applications or movements to autonomous database very straight or lift and shift onto the infrastructure as easy as possible. Trials of the database allowing you, for example, to get started. We believe very much in cloud coexistence. We're not forgetting the last 30 years of investments that have been made, knowledge that is there. There is every reason to suggest we should think hard and constantly about the horses for courses, the appropriate workloads, the appropriate place as we move across. You'll find us thinking very much that way. And just as I opened up, we've all got our role to play in embracing these challenges that we face and using technology to do so. We continue to believe in providing the most complete and integrated platform, and now one with intelligence at every layer. Our journey's finished, but all of us, of course, are really on journeys into the future. There is no doubt about it, it's going to be very turbulent. On any journey, especially turbulent ones, it's great to have somebody a traveling companion coming alongside you, preferably somebody who's maybe got a bit of experience and knows the terrain. In Oracle, we would love to be your traveling partner on that journey in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your kind attention during this morning, and do enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>